bench at Intro to Programming. Please come. thinking maybe I should just for the heck of it reboot to get the uh, M player out of the uh, stream okay question is shall we wait for a little bit or start start okay <laughs> what do you mean Um, point. 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 It's working. We're online. That's probably the video stream going out. About. It's not really a network connection. It's kind of a hole. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's what it is. The black hole started here. <laughs> this black box. <laughs> oh, wait, that was lunch. <laughs> or actually, Len, it's not what she said. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Shame. Oh, the shame. That's not what she said last night. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Well, let's get started. So, presumably, you guys all know New Code Bench was released, and um, and uh, what we have is is version 42 of Code, Ven code Bench. The last update to CodeBench that went out publicly was version 23 that went out. Uh, looks like this would be September 9th, uh, September 17th, 2011, just around uh, Amy West two years ago. So since then, there have been 17 pages of release notes here of bug fixes and improvements and additions and then enhancements to the, uh, to the program. Uh, going through this to just refresh my memory on what things had changed in the last two years, um, well, I was able to count up that there had been two eight, 281 bug fixes and tweaks and enhancements, and in addition to that, a number of major features added to uh, CodeBench. Um, so in general, this is really a demonstration of the CodeBench that we see today, what was released last Monday and uh, what you all can, can download, if you haven't already, to uh, help you get started in programming for Amiga OS. Um, what we have is, and I'll, I'll just do a, a fairly quick run through of CodeBench in general. Um, what we have is, is the primary start, starting position here with CodeBench. And you've got this toolbar here that allows you to control projects. Project is essentially an individ, uh, uh, collection of files, what you do to create a program. Uh, it's your source code, it's your documentation, it can be anything. Any files that are involved in doing, in, in completing and developing the project. Um, what I'll do is I'll bring up one of the client, one of the projects that we used for our programming classes that everybody online should have come to Sacramento to have taken uh, this, uh, this week. Um, this was the uh, uh, IP client that we had uh, had demonstrated and gone over on Thursday. Um, so as you see, I opened up CodeBench and in this small window that we have so we can broadcast it online, you see a lot of overlapping stuff. Um, it's usually a little bit more organized and clearer when you have it on a 24 inch monitor than on a uh, 1024 by 768 screen. But uh, as CodeBench starts up, it always throws up this little hint to tell you about, uh, uh, you know, little things about how CodeBench works and so on. They're just miscellaneous things like how you can set the protection bits on your files. Uh, thank you. 
Um, what you'll see is a variety of files once you have a uh, project loaded up. You have the build window, which is where feedback comes in when you compile. I'll close that. That'll open up later. Um, you have um, this new addition to the program, macros. And you have the ability to record macros. I'll get into that momentarily. Uh, the clip manager is a place where you can see what things you've got on your clipboard and to access those things. For example, if I come over here and copy a bunch of text, you'll see what it is here in the clip manager. Yeah, I have the ability to then you know, select these things and use them and, and, and apply them to the, uh, to the edited document. While you're in the project, the, probably the, the most important window is the project, um, the, uh, the project window that shows you all the files in that project. Typically, what I found with CodeBench, the best thing to do is just start a folder, a directory. Uh, I've got a, a single directory path where I keep all my C projects. And in there, I always create a new folder every time I create a project. And I put all the files for that project in there. The seek files, the, the, he, the includes, the docs, the everything. And, I, and that way, I have a, a nice discrete folder that I can move around. I don't need to worry about a file that is created for this project, a make file getting confused or mixed in with other files and other directories. So in the case of this project and uh, what you see, you've got, and then finally, the editor. Um, this right here, is, as you see, is the source code to the program. And uh, um, that's where you'll spend the bulk of your time. Um, so if, I guess I'll start here with the editor. Most of it is looks superficially the same as what we saw before. Um, it's syntax highlighting. The syntax highlighting covers um, C code. In the new version, there were new an languages added. Now you can open up AREX scripts. Um, you know, if I open up a, uh, if I go and open up an AREX script like, uh, you know, here, something to set volume and mixer, syntax highlighted in, in AREX. Um, course, the way that CodeBench works is I just opened a file. It's going to ask me when I close it, would I like to add this to the project? Again, if I open a file from anywhere in the system, from the SDK, from anywhere else or within this folder, I can come in here and say, yes, I'd like to add it to the project. Now, what you see in this project window is now you've got an additional file in this project. If I save that file, that project, and you can either save it there or you could save it in the, um, ha, can't see the screen at the bottom. If I save it there, you've got, or you could save it here on your main toolbar. There's a save button. So you have the ability to keep your files, everything regarding the project in one place. Um, when I was developing this, uh, this project here, this client, a simple demonstration of how to go online, get data, and come back, this project I used another program I had written and, and is on OS4 Depot called Audio Remote Server as my um, you know, source for some of these code snippets I was using. So I included that file in this project. Anytime I want to, I can get in the file, and there it is. And this was the source code for that other pro program, and I was able to cut out chunks of this program and paste it in. You have a tabbed editor into the example that I was writing for the class. So you have the ability to keep many files open at any time and save that. Um, you have the ability to keep project notes on the file. So I was able to keep information here. Um, for example, a friend of mine, Andy Broad, was posting some examples of uh, headers uh, for web pages that we used for this demonstration. And I stuck them in here so I'd, I could keep them handy and around. One of the problems with the old code bench is every time you grabbed another C file and being a fairly inexperienced C coder, I use a lot of example codes, and I'll grab C codes from anywhere. The SDK, other programs I've worked on, other pr programs I've downloaded, you have the ability to stick those files in the project area here. But obviously, when you compile, you don't want that audio remote server code getting compiled in with this program. So you have the ability on a file-by-file -file basis to control things with regards to that file. Um, you just have a pop-up menu, and you can come in here and do simple editing, remove, rename, delete. The best thing, you can also tell it you want to ignore that file. 
So I just unignored it. If I want to ignore it, I come down here, say ignore. That file's in the project, but it's just in there as a reference. It's not going to be called up. Um, you know, so again, you have all these files that are all part of the project. You have a single unified in interface to see everything. Yes? No, it does not. It is a link. It's a reference to other things, which is really handy because, again, as a beginner coder, I'm, what I've been doing is I go and explore something. I, I wanna, the first thing I wrote was to create an AREX port. Well, there's some examples in the SDK examples folder, but I wanted to kind of cut that up and make my own version of that that was more clean in the way it, it demonstrated receiving and sending AREX messages. So I was able to go in there and open up that file from the SDK, refer to it in this project. I never had to move anything. I was able to tell it, don't compile it. So it never got included with my project. And I was able then to work on my own file, copying things back and forth, comparing source code, looking for things to do. And it's, so it's part of this project, but it's not, the file wasn't necessarily moved there. Yes? Then you're really deleting the file. Yeah, it's, if you go in here, yes, you can remove the file, which removes it from the project. You delete the file, it's going away. And, you know, I can go over here and say, deleting this will actually remove it from the project and delete it from the disk permanently. <laughs> yes, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I don't want to delete this file. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there you go. That's why I have another hard drive in my briefcase. Uh, so, um, just, just to go over this, so we've gone over the toolbar. Um, one of the things that we have here, and unfortunately I can't bring it up because of the monitor, one of the features of, of CodeBench is you have this bottom bar that pops up, and it allows you to see all of the windows, all of the, um, of the, uh, there, let's, if I pull down here at the bottom, and it just barely the top of the screen comes up. Um, I don't know if maybe Brian, you could push that projector up a little bit so it catches the bottom of the screen there. Uh, nope, it's not. It's just simply so. <laughs> there's the top. That little blue line there's the top. That right there is this bar that pops up and it gives you buttons for every single window that has to do with the code bench uh, environment you're in. Now, typically, I run this on the workbench. A lot of people choose to run CodeBench on its own screen. In either case, you run, you run into having half a dozen different windows on the screen. You can add programs to this bottom bar here that, will, that are helpers for what's going on. Now, I'm kind of shooting blind here to see what, what I'm hitting, but I can hit some of these programs, I think. So it's really a blind way to do this, but you can, you can bring up programs, an Autodocs viewer, you can open up a shell in your, pro, in your project window, you can open up uh, help, and basically you have all these little icons, and that's configurable. If you decide you want to have a calculator as part of your code bench environment, you go into the, uh, you go into the, uh, I'll put that out of there. So if you want to have a, uh, you have the preferences, and there are a lot of preferences in CodeBench. You have a lot of ways to configure your environment. And that icon bar at the bottom allows you to configure these things. You can open up a shell in, in your project directory. You can open up uh, the Autodoc viewer, and you can open up your, your CodeBench client, your chat client, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, you can add more programs here, and those are things that allow you to, to you know, add tools to your programming environment. You want a calculator, you want a debugger, you want other tools. They can be all stacked up in this bar along the bottom of, of the screen. And th that bar is there. Whenever you move the mouse to the bottom of the screen, it pops up. It shows you what you have there. Um, while we're in here, I mean, these are the general preferences, and as you see, you've got six tabs of settings to allow you to configure your environment. And, you know, Simon has been doing a great job of adding things to allow you to really come up with an efficient 
uh, elegant place to be able to get coding done and to be able to say, uh, you know, where you store your projects, whether or not you have uh, hints that come up, whether or not you have, um, uh, you know, how the, the, the environment handles your, your work. Um, display, you've got the ability to go on the workbench or a dedicated screen. All of these windows that you see here, like the, uh, the macro window and the clip manager and all that, you can configure whether or not you want these things to come up. Um, all of that stuff uh, and the editor, how to con control it. One of the nice features that Adam, uh, Simon added to the, uh, to the project here is key bindings. You have the ability to configure how your keyboard works to immense detail. Uh, if you, yes? This is global. These settings are global. There's also a whole other raft of settings on a per project basis. So in this case here, you know, if you, if you want your, your editor, for example, to operate exactly like Notepad does in all OS4 programs, where when you go shift up, it goes up by pages, and you use control and arrow keys to select things, you go in here and set these things, you know, you have right here, select text, character left, and it's control left. If you want to select the word to the left, it's control, uh, oh, I haven't set it in this yet. <laughs> you go in here, and if you say, okay, I want to select a word to the left, you come over here and hit learn, and you say control, alt, left. You've just configured it. It's very quick and easy, and you can configure exactly how you want it to work. I know that there are a lot of people that, that like the way other editors have done their editing, and you have to mark blocks and things like that. TurboText, I remembered, you didn't have a way to just start, you know, control down and start selecting text. You have to do a mark, and then you had a block. It's like you had a hot cursor. Well, you've got the ability to mark the block here, um, right here. Mark it there, and there's also another setting here. Uh, somewhere in here, there, D, D, D. Ah, I don't know, I can't find it here now. I think that's it, but toggle mark block, there you go. And so you have the ability to do right Amiga B and it just starts selecting the text wherever you move the cursor. That's a mode of editing that you know isn't typically the Amiga way of doing it, I believe, but a lot of editors have done it that way. Yes? Uh, well, let me see here. You've got right Amiga shift. I believe, let's see what we got. Like that? There you go. Right Amiga shift B. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this editor relies on a, on a gadget and a, a, a reaction gadget that was called the rich rich text editor. And it's a specific new gadget that's that was developed by Simon Archer and uh, and Peter um, Zeron uh, online X E R O N and. Um, these guys put this editor together and it has a lot of powers you see in the syntax highlighting. That syntax highlighting is backed up by a series of XML files that define what the language is. That's the reason why they were able to add support for AREX and Python. You have syntax highlighting in Python. If you happen to be a COBOL programmer, well, <laughs> add a syntax file for it and you've got syntax highlighting for that one too. Um, so there, you've got a little bit of a rundown here on the editor and how, how source code is put together. And uh, you know, I'm trying to see what else we to tell you about. Um, we've talked a bit about the project window, this window here. And as you see, there are the files there. You do have the ability to grab files and move them around. Actually, and I'm not even able to do it. What did I do? Oh, well, here you go. What am I saying? So you have the ability to move files around. And um, ha! And I just did something bad. I think I have a bug report for Simon. <laughs> um, let's 
So uh, you have the ability to move files around, but hopefully not out of the category it's in. <laughs> so, uh, and obviously you close this and you're closing the project. I'm going to discard the changes because I did bad things. <laughs> um, the uh, editor, as I talked about, you have syntax highlighting, you have the ability to edit bindings, and those bindings are, and I have a message from Simon, and you have the ability to uh, open up, um, you have a pop-up menu in the text that allows you to do a lot of things within the, uh, the source code. This is OS4 notifications here tell you you have messages coming in and things like that. Um, Nice handy feature there. Um, one of the things that, that we have is we've got the, uh, the SE version. This is the free version that Simon uploaded uh, beginning of last week. Um, there is a full version that has been done that allows you to open up multiple projects it allows you to have more control over the configuration of the system, even more than what we see here. Um, you have the ability to turn these uh, did you know messages off. Uh, you have the ability to, as I said, open multiple projects and, um, and proceed with doing things there. Um, as I said, you have this pop-up menu here that now allows you to do a lot of things within the text um, to allow, allow you to paste and, and edit blocks if you decide, oh, well, I want to, uh, you know, I've got code here that I want indent, you can come over here and say block indent and you are able to move text around. There's also keyboard equivalents for a lot of this stuff. Um, one thing which I find kind of handy is if you're, you know, decided oh, I need to do a new function or something like that, you have the ability to do what, what are called constructs in CodeBench. You can go in here and say insert different structures. You want to do a do while, there you go. You've just inserted that code. Now, the while, for example, is part of what's built in. Uh, I find I like to have a little bit more help than that even. So <laughs> I, I did things like I created a function entry. And I hit that, and I was able to insert the whole guts, the, the starting skeleton of a whole function definition, declaration. And I could come in here and say, you know, print F and start coding away. And all the rest of this was inserted by that, that construct. Um, you just go in there and edit it. And you come in here, insert, and these are the things that have been defined. Edit the constructs. There they all are. So you get each one of these function. And you can open that up. And you have a miniature editor inside of here of the text that you wanted to add to your program. So if you you find yourself using some chunk of text a lot, you can stack them in here, and this is something that'll be there project-wide, I mean, uh, system-wide. Really, really handy, fast way to get things done and, and uh, modify the code um, and, and get your editing. Uh, one of the things that he added was this uh, uh, macros, and you have the ability to record macros, so you know, if you hit one of these buttons, or if you hit the right mouse button over it, you can record a macro and say, it's recording, it's still red. Come over here, oops, oh, helps if I, uh, Stop the recording, give it a name, uh, print, uh, let's say here, print, there. And now I have a, a new macro there on the F1 key. Again, an easy way to insert chunks of code. This could be anything. If you find that you've got some variable names or some uh, whatever, it's a, yet another way to automate little chunks of coding that you might want to do or need, find yourself needing to do often while you're writing something. And obviously, as you're, you're doing all this, what the critical thing is, you're writing code. You want to turn it into a program. And, uh, um, you know, 
if, uh, a, as you do that, the, the build system of this is all automated. And it's automated such that all you need to do is just go down to the, gosh, small screen is not good. There it is. All you do is just click on the build icon and it automatically makes a make file that ties all the pieces together and builds your project. Um, for any project, and when you create a new project, you have another settings window that controls everything of that project. Um, that settings window, oof. you set the name of the project, you set the directory of the project, you can set whether or not this project is on a, on a remote server, if it's SVN, uh, you can do this with Open Amiga. I know that Simon does this with things on OS4 and he connects to their SVN. You have the ability to control how make is handled. You have the ability to change what gets included and modify the make file from within the GUI. Um, the compiler, you have the ability to control the flags that are used in the compiler. One of the really handy things is you have the ability to turn on and off debug symbols. You turn this item on, it automatically creates the formatting that allows you to create debugging code, include debugging code in your executable. And in reality, what it does is actually you compile, it creates two programs, the regular program and the dot debug program. That dot debug program will allow you to see when something goes wrong, or if something goes wrong, where the crash was, it'll tell you what line it was on in your program and you're able to track it down. Very handy. Um, we went over that in the class and I could show you guys more on that. Oops, I meant to show you something else. I meant to show you more, I could show you more on all of this uh, back at the, uh, at the table. Uh, the linker, that's where you set what the name of the program is and how it includes libraries and all of that. The environment, you know, I prefer to have it use tabs, not spaces for tabbing and indenting. Help, whether or not you want to have uh, uh, help as you type and other assistance as you're coding. Help as you type is a handy thing. What that gives you is as you're going through, as you're going through and editing and you hit system functions, of which this program has probably damn near none. There you go. It tells you system, both user functions as well as system functions that match what's underneath your cursor. So if you're going through, you know, you see there's doing matching of brackets. As you go through and open things up or act, use system functions, it's telling you line node is one of the functions in one of these programs. Uh, if it's a uh, OS system function, you get that information too. Again, this program is really simple. If I go into the other program here, audio remote server, huh. I think it's indexing everything in the file. But since I had it turned off, there we go. If you go into this, here I am on, a, on an Amiga OS system function. It gives me the whole format for that function so I know what has to be put in there. For anybody starting out coding, and if you're going to do something at the beginning, like you, we were talking about Len, you need to know how to match uh, file names. All you have to do is type match. It gives you the whole rest of that line there. And if you double click on this line here, it actually inserts it into the code, complete with all the things that you need to fill in for the parameters. The other beauty, if you're a beginning coder, and you don't know what that match pattern no case does, you can come over here and just double click on it and it brings up the auto docs on that function. That has been in there, but that is just the greatest feature in the world. You don't know what this is, you can find it very easily. And it goes on beyond that. I mean, this, you might look at this and say, well, this isn't exactly what I need. I need something better. Well, look, there are other options written down here. Each one of these, you can shift click on those and pull up the other function and do this as far as uh, you've got uh, memory. <laughs> so, um, so again, that's, uh, it just keeps opening things up in tabs. And uh, there we are in this source code and you have the ability to open up and get help on the, damn near anything you've got here, including functions that I've written that are in this program.
So, um, again, back here at this program, we want to compile it. We hit this little button down here. Now I left an error in this file, so it should cause problems, but apparently, oh, there it is. There's the output when you compile. And it's just telling you that there's a warning there, something went wrong. You have the beauty of being able to just double click on it and it takes you right to the line with the error. This text tells you what's wrong with it. Uh, we can't see it clearly on the screen that there's a declar declaration missing there from this text. Now, that's basically, I know there is no FF close, that's a typo. So I'll come down here and I take that out of there. And then again, I say build, command D, builds it, automatically saves the file. It checks to see if it needs to make a make file. In this case, it didn't. We didn't change any, add any files to the project. And it's done. Zero error, zero warnings, everything's done. To run the program, you just click here. I know this right here is a shell program. So I'll take it in the shell and I'll say run. There it is, it opened it up. There's the program. And it even looks like something went wrong. <laughs> so. uh, great. Yeah, you have to put something in, and it looks like it got something got buggered right there. But um, easily enough, the program ran and closed. The other thing which we can do to run programs is, again, as I said, CodeBench, you can open up the um, shell right in the directory you're in. And uh, there's the directory I'm in. There's the program. I run that program. I can type in what's the weather in London. We can see what's happening to Simon. London. Oh, this is London, New Mexico. <laughs> or Lon, New Mexico. <laughs> what, is the, what is the airport code for London? LH. LHR. Ah, <laughs> okay, LHR. Okay, so it's 55 and partly cloudy at Heathrow. <laughs> Simon, I assume you're listening. It's uh, about 75 degrees Fahrenheit here and sunny in Sacramento, California. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, that, uh, that's how easy it is to compile things and how easy it is to find the problems when you compile things. And you fix the problem and you just say build again, it saves it and compiles it again. One of the nice and greatest things that was added besides a whole slew, um, you know, I've got, like I said, 281 fixes in the, in the latest version of CodeBench that you all have, is um, the addition of a CodeBench chat client. And, uh, so we've got that chat client. I've actually got it running here in the background. It can be configured to start up any time you start CodeBench. So while you're working, if you need help, you can at any time come over here and say, there you go. There's the chat client. And here's a, lot, a variety of friends of mine that, that I've uh, connected to. There are more people I can look up that all have CodeBench or have downloaded it or included it. Um, so. Here you have a list of people that already have downloaded CodeBench 4.1, These people, you know somebody on here, all you have to do is just select them and add them to your list. And if they're online, they turn green, as you see here. Um, I was chatting with Rigo earlier. He obviously got offline. But it's telling me there's an M. This is an asynchronous chat client. The messages are stored online. I can open that up. And he says, here, I can drag. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> he, he just, he was watching earlier when we had the problem with the, uh, with the uh, file. If I, t I uh, drag that file by accident and moved it up out of the box there, he says, if you hold the control key down, then you can drag it. Except it's not working. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> well, then, then I can send Simon a message and he'll get it when he logs on. Control, <laughs> dragging. Oops. Didn't work. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no, you can't, unfortunately. 
Yeah, I just don't think he wants us spamming everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask him a filing mantis question mark there and then send. You send it and it just goes on to the server and he'll get the same M next to his name. And when he gets online next time, he'll, he'll get it. One of uh, what's that? Uh, that was uh, that was a few minutes ago. Um, oh, actually, or did you just do that? Ha ha! Now, uh, one of the things that's handy about this is if you notice, I could come over here and say send multi-line messages. That's really handy. Um, the reason why it's handy is, and you do command S to, ah uh, yes he did. Um, you have only one file, there's nothing to move. You need to multiple files, aha. Uh -huh. um, oh, there he's back in. One of the things that's handy about that is you can send code samples to somebody. So you're chatting with somebody and you go, damn I just can't get this thing to work, it's crashing. <laughs> and I have that feeling very often. <laughs> You can come over here and just come over here and say copy message to clipboard. And it'll copy it to the clipboard and then come back here to, you know, iconifying this would help. There we go. They come over here and if this were source code, paste it into place. And there it is, his message. And obviously if it were source code, you know, it would be formatted with line feeds and all that to fit and go in there. Um, paste it and do that. I could spam Simon with, uh, with messages. And, uh, and so you have the ability to, um, to send code samples back and forth. One of the things that, um, that was going to be released with the 4.2 release that was put out, I guess, Monday, was also the ability to send files back and forth. But Sunday afternoon, we discovered there was still a little bit more work needed to uh, we discovered a few more issues with sending files, so that's something that'll be coming out, I hope, soon, because that's just yet another great way to be able to, you write something, compile something, and you want somebody to test it. Well, one of your buddies is online. You just come over here and then say, send file. There used to be a send file thing here, and pick a file and send it, send it away, so. Um, it's getting all, Yes. The history is there forever. Um, you know, I am, well, okay. <laughs> it, you see here, you could say showing messages. I mean, you could show all the messages, the last 50 messages, the last 10 messages. So it goes back and refreshes the list, and there you go. And so now you have the last messages. Um, that are left from, uh, you know, who knows when. It all says today. Oh, yes, I see. This was earlier when I was setting up, so. And these were messages that were going back and forth. And, you know, if you want to show all the messages back to time, you can, but you get to see all the messages when we were beta testing all of this and <laughs> find out what, what trials and tribulations we had. But, um, yeah, you could save the messages and it's asynchronous, which is nice because somebody here is working when somebody else at home might be coding in Britain and uh, you get to get the messages when you, when you log in and get on your computer. Um, so that, that uh, really is, is um, the, the nicest addition to CodeBench, I think, for, for beginner users in particular. Um, any other questions? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Simon, if you didn't hear that, uh, there's a request here. If you could just watch over everybody's shoulders as they're working, and you could be fixing their errors as they type them. I'm sure you'd love to do that. Yes. Well, I have been begging him for years now to include a fix bugs wizard, and somehow he just hasn't gotten around to it. I, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> 
the, uh, <laughs> the uh, you know, one of the things that he added also to this was in the macros. The, the macros are actually recorded, as I recall, as, as um, I can open that back up again, uh, keyboard macros. These macros are actually recorded as um, AREC scripts. He added a, uh, ah, I'm not able to get into the edit macro. The, an AREX port was added to CodeBench, and, and that was something that's also still in the works, and I'm kind of lobbying, right, Simon? I'm lobbying for him to, <laughs> to uh, add more AREX commands so we can, we can add little bits and pieces to this to, uh, to get more stuff done. Um, and uh, so this is the latest and greatest of CodeBench. And we had also talked about doing something on beginning programming and all that. But I think the best way to do that would be if you stop by and visit at the Hyperion table, I can sit down and show you how to get a project started and how to, how to get into trouble and get addicted to coding. And uh, it is very addicting, and it's a lot of fun. And it's a lot of fun to see your stuff done and working and serving your, your needs. So. Code bench is a way to get it done and get it done easily. Um, let me know if you guys got any questions. Um, I think at this point they are just. Right now it's mainly text and editing. You move the cursor around, and it repeats the same cursor movements. Um, you know, if I come down here and I say uh, record this macro, and if I start here on this, oops, I did not get it to record. Um, I say record macro, and I start here, and I start moving around the text, and then start over here and typing, and then move down some more, and start typing some more, and then go up to here. It's doing a recording of that. It says, and again, if I come over here and I paste or I record, hit the macro again. See, it moved all the way around as it was going. It's recording everything I'm doing in the editor. Now, the thing that we were testing at one point about a year ago was the ability to actually, in recording a macro, to have also AREX commands. And I actually had done a little script with and sent to Simon, but it started to reveal there's a lot of intricacies about how you handle the things that the AREX command does in an environment like this. And, and it's, it's, there's a lot more complexity to it. So it was pulled out and to be added later. Um, so anything else, guys? OK. Well, thank you very much. Go download code bench. <laughs>